Good afternoon, my name is Brian Kubicki. Uh, today I'm going to uh, share with you a little bit about the work I've been doing here um, in our reserve with uh, in situ conservation with different amphibians. Um, I've been living here in Costa Rica now for 21 years. Uh, I own a couple different private reserves. Uh, the reserve we're in here we call the Guajicon Rainforest Reserve. It's in the central Caribbean foothills of Costa Rica. Uh, the property has a total size of 50 hectares and today we've uh, you know, registered up 56 species of amphibians in here and several of which we've been working on for many years uh, doing in situ conservation management of their populations by either improving natural habitats or creating artificial breeding sites. Uh, so what we're going to do today first, um, in reality at this, at this moment we're working on two different aspects of kind of their uh, in situ conservation. Uh, like I mentioned, one is we're creating these artificial breeding sites, and the other aspect is that we're uh, doing some forest management. So some areas of secondary forest that was uh, disturbed prior to owning this property and being a private reserve, we've been going in and managing some, some of the forest there, removing undesirable plant species. So we're going to briefly go through and show you some examples of that real quick, and then we're going to go down and look at some of the, uh, the creative, creative habitats we've done for creating uh, different species of uh, amphibians, especially one taxon in particular is Agalichnus lamor, the ghost leaf frog or lemur leaf frog. So we'll be looking at some of those aspects of that and seeing some really straightforward, simple uh, practices we've been doing here for since 2003, so it's been going on uh, 16 years. So you can see here at this point, um, we're in a section of uh, secondary forest and reserve that we have yet to go through and work on the, the habitat management. What we're doing in these areas, as you can see, there's a abundance here of certain vines and this type of a fern that kind of dominates the understory. We're basically going through and selectively removing a few species of plants that kind of inhibit the natural regenerative um, process of this secondary forest area. Um, we're going to go now to an area that we've been doing this, it's been a couple of years since we initiated it, and you can see the difference in how much more cleaner uh, the understory is. In old growth forest areas, typically the understory is very clean. Um, you, know, you can walk through it, it's not this thick, tangled mess, this is very typical of secondary, young secondary growth. So we're going to go through, we're just basically trying to um, just increase the, the regenerative aspects of certain parts of the reserve that are um, that have been disturbed in private you know previously to being uh, you know, being protected there are large sections of the of the reserve that are primary forest so it's very important that we've got seed and this kind of seed just first coming in here and um, in these areas that we've been able to manage uh, real quickly we start to uh, achieve a nice diversity of understory species of either be you know, heliconias palms um, other trees and shrubs and just other aeroids, just typical species of assemblages of an understory here in this section of Costa Rica and these pre-mountain rainforests here on the Caribbean slopes. So now here we're in a different section of forest. This is one of the areas that we did this forest management. Uh, it's been a couple years now, but you can see how the understory is starting to recover, how much you can see much, you know, it's not in dominance of vines, you can actually see into the forest a ways in. Um, this is more typical of what a more healthier, uh, you know, forest should look like. Um, so it's uh, definitely a progress. There's about seven hectares here in the property we've been working on this uh, over the last uh, two and a half, three years. Uh, we've been working in different sections. The section I just showed you that was hadn't been touched yet, that's one of the last remaining sections which are right now currently starting to get in there. The first aspect as we get in, we cut vines and we uh, start to remove the ferns uh, that are in the either bind, binding ferns that go up into the trees, otherwise terrestrial ferns, or certain species in particular we're targeting. And it's just simply physical removal. And then going back over uh, six month periods, going back through and removing once they start to pop up again. And usually after a couple of years, you can see here, uh, the, the, the species assemblage, the composition changes, so that's a lot harder for these kind of undesirable species to get a foothold again. Uh, they got originally got a strong foothold when this area was you know, more disturbed, more cut, and they kind of had more of an advantage. 
So that's why it's nice coming back into these areas that have got a little bit of growth um, to go through and remove some of these undesirable species and really give the forest a much uh, improved uh, just vigor as far as regeneration, which is very important also for the different amphibian species by having a more healthier understory diversity um, as far as just emigration and immigration between different metapopulations here within the reserve. And here's just another example. Again, this is another section of one of the more uh, later staged uh, patches of forest that we've been working on this forest management project. Uh, again, you can see just a more desirable, kind of healthier uh, composition of the understory here in this forest. Um, again, the aspect I was saying, you can actually see back in there for 50 or 100 meters. Uh, and a nice diversity of understory plants, such as different aeroids, palms, uh, little treelets. Uh, they're just very important for as far as just uh, kind of recruitment of different species here. And we've obviously been seeing a good uh, increase even in some of the different anurin species that are typical in this area, especially different Krog asterids that will be just kind of epithelially on the vegetation in this area. Um, so it's a very, it's a lot of work and as far as the physical work, but it's something that we feel is extremely important, especially in these sections of, of you know, forests that have been uh, disturbed in the past. And it's a reality that, you know, again, in these different areas, you've got kind of a, a mixture of areas that are, you have old growth forest next to these secondary forest areas and typically in little patches. Um, it's, uh, so it's important to get in there and try and just do a little bit of management just to try and kind of shift back that uh, composition of the, the flora back to a more desirable natural aspect, which is typical indicative of these types of forests in these pre montane slopes of the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. So now I'm going to share with you um, a little bit what I was mentioning. Again, the other aspect of in situ conservation, and actually what we've been working for with since back to the beginning of 2003, is uh, some of these creating and modifying and just improving uh, reproductive sites for amphibians, obviously principally anurans, here within the reserve. This is an example we're seeing here. This was an area that was disturbed. It was actually um, back in 2003. It was an open kind of grassy area. The grassy area was swampy. Uh, what we simply did is went in here and removed about a half a meter of sedge peat, just trying to uh, rehabilitate it and just kind of return it back to probably what it was like before this area was disturbed. Um, you know, years ago there were cattle. There was a little bit of cattle grazing in this area, so we just simply have... Uh, removed that sedge peat um, and became a pond, as you can see now, in open water. And obviously over the last, uh, you know, 16 years, uh, the forest here has kind of come up. So it's, uh, you can see a lot of these different aeroids and, uh, and different species of plants surrounding the pond. Um, prior to rehabilitating this, there was only one species of frog that we heard or saw uh, utilizing this site, uh, Lepidactylus melanonotus. Um, and now since then, we've documented 13 species of frogs uh, breeding here in this pond, uh, including uh, massive uh, reproductive events with uh, Agalichnus sporelli, a uh, squirrel's leaf frog. So it's been a very uh, successful uh, project here with this pond. Um, again, just simply going back through, trying to reverse some of the effects of uh, just disturbance by previous uh, activities, uh, human activity. So here now we're going to be looking at another type of in situ conservation project we've been working on. This particular one involves pl placing these plastic tubs in kind of sp specific points within the reserve. Um, this is focused principally on two uh, taxa of, of frogs, uh, Agalichnus lemur the lemur leaf frog or ghost leaf frog, and then Crucioila silviae, which is Sylvia's splendid leaf frog. As you can see here, there are several tadpoles in here. These dark tadpoles are Crucioila. There's also some Agalichnus lemur in there, but principally what we're looking at here are Crucioila silviae. It's very simple by simply placing these plastic tubs, which are a very cheap, very cost-effective 
method, uh, putting them in here, as you can see, we put this in the butress of this Calvija tree, this Carapa guianensis, and uh, just simply these different, you know, these aeroids here overhanging the, some aeroids above the tank that are overhanging the, the water, or even just simple these branches that are overhanging the water serve as areas for ovipositing sites. So you can see, we're panning up here, you can see these, these aeroids. So a lot of times they'll either ovaposit on these actual, on these, just the leaves, over, the leaves overhanging the water. And uh, again, it's a very simple, very cost effective. This little tub costs $20. Uh, we place several at different places in the reserve and it's been extremely successful. We've got definitely every single tub we've placed on their own animals have shown up. Uh, typically within six months you'll start seeing either males or uh, actual eggs deposited on the vegetation just the st or structures overhanging these tubs. We have several different meta populations in the reserve um, through using these different tubs and even also we'll use uh, 55 gallon barrels cut, uh, with the cut the top cut off they have a little bit more volume of water. The one main uh, thing you have to do is once in a while, typically once or twice a year, maybe come through and relieve and remove, physically remove a little bit of the leaf litter uh, that accumulates in these tubs. But the water is, uh, we don't put any water, it's just simply from rainwater. You know, fortunately here in Guajica, we receive uh, an average of about six meters of rain per year, so there's not any kind of shortage of having to add water to any of these tanks. We have uh, this region of Costa Rica doesn't really have much of a defined dry season. Just a uh, uh, just a few months of the year, a little bit drier, but still we average typically at least uh, 200 to 250 millimeters of, of rainfall in those drier months. So this is an example of something very simple, but very effective. Now here I'm going to share with you guys, this is another example of a pond we made. But this pond is actually, we purposely did this in more of an open area. This, this pond was made back in 2008. Uh, we call this the pasture pond because when we made it, it was more of an open grassy area. And you see now it's uh, grown up quite a bit with young secondary growth. We're actually going to be coming in here and cleaning this a little bit to open it back up. Um, there are certain types of frogs that actually prefer slightly more open areas. So that's what's important too for, you know, to have a wide variety of species to have a, you know, also corresponding wide variety of habitats that are kind of more specific to each particular species preference. Um, so again, I just wanted to show here one of the other examples of a different type of pond that's um, you know, definitely not something that's more a typical forest requirement. So again, the thing is just simply, it's been over the years by creating these different habitats, we've greatly increased the population sizes of numerous taxa. Um, one species in particular has been a very uh, successful here is with the lemur leaf frog or the ghost leaf frog, Agalichnus lemur. We've uh, created different habitats for that species and started working with them since 2003. And now we're even seeing even like um, populations colonizing outside of the reserve and, and suitable habitat in neighboring properties. So it's just it's really neat to see that metapopulation support, that emigration of individuals uh, you know, looking for and colonizing uh, suitable sites. And again, you know, something that's pretty straightforward, um, and, you know, and uh, just simply by creating different habitats and letting the animals kind of do what they've kind of evolved to do, you know, just kind of giving them a little head start and a little push in the right direction and, uh, and getting them going. That's definitely been, again, here, uh, my project, we've been, uh, you know, since 2003 pioneering different ways of in situ conservation methodologies and um, definitely seen the, the great aspects of it and uh, the benefits and strongly recommend uh, that it be considered for different tax in different parts of the world where people are concerned about trying to, you know, reestablish or augment certain population sizes. Thank you very much, and for, hope you enjoyed this brief uh, uh, kind of, you know, just ex explanation and introduction to a little bit about, um, you know, my project here, which is you know, Costa Rican Freeman Research Center, and specifically here in this reserve, the Guajacan Rainforest Reserve. Uh, thank you very much.